So who are these two Australian lunatics and why did we let them on stage? That is a great question. <laughs> My name is Matt Witherow. Uh, I work for REA Group in Australia. I work for the Global Architecture Team, so we focus on projects of uh, significant risk or uh, where there's a context boundary that crosses and that will have a large architectural impact. Yep, and my name is John Contad, and I'm part of the global infrastructure team, and we look after shared patterns and practices and services that we use across the company yeah. for REA Group. Right, so who is REA Group? Great question, audience. We are Australia's leading property website, realestate.com.au. But we're not just in Australia, we have presence in um, Southeast Asia, in India as well, as well as America. Yeah. Uh, flatmates.com.au as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of commercial real estate as well. Mm -hmm. We have and about uh, 600 engineers that are spread out over seven countries, but uh, most of them are in Melbourne. Yep, Australia. and each one of us Ooh. working towards uh, better platforms and better services to provide for our customers. That's right. So, we are going to talk to you a little bit today about this triangle of knowledge. And this is it right here. It's very complicated. It's split into two components. The bottom bit is the fundamentals. So we like to think of learning as um, split into this triangle where the fundamentals are the basics. They're the pragmatic knowledge. Yeah. How do I run a Docker container? How do I execute this command? Right. I don't understand uh, virtualization technology, but I do know how to use Docker. Yeah. So first, we're going to investigate that bottom component. Yep. So uh, John and I are a large part of the learning culture at REA and in the greater city of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a lot of opportunity over the years to experiment uh, with different learning cultures and coaching and teaching and, and how we work with people. So we're going to go through a few of uh, the things that we've done over that time to try and achieve the bottom part of that triangle. So the first one is DevOps Guild, which JC and I lead for uh, REA in Melbourne. So I don't know if you're all familiar with the concept of a guild. I'm pretty sure it was popularized by Spotify. Spotify yeah. So uh, for us, it looks like this. And it's an opportunity where we have lots of different systems engineers or SREs or performance engineers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but they're spread out through the company. It's quite large. And this is an opportunity to bring us all together, uh, share knowledge, break down those silos that can exist between teams. Uh, that, in turn, helps to stop different teams from reinventing the wheel, reinventing the wheel. You know, an opportunity to share deployment tooling. Uh, and recently, it's also been a great opportunity for us to bring in external guests and leverage an even larger sharing economy. Uh, and in turn, we can send our own people uh, outside to their guilds. So uh, you know, if you, wanna, <laughs> if you wanna come to our guilds, we're more than happy to have you. Anybody, you're more than welcome. Just give me a ping on Twitch. Yep. And along the same lines, we actually sponsor a lot of community events as well, because we actually believe that while a good engineer is raised by this village of fantastic and brilliant people, good art organizations thrive in a city where you have other organizations uh, uh, learning from each other. All those shared problems that we do have, we sync up from time to time. So uh, we do a couple of meetups um, every now and then. We host them. And um, yeah, they turn up fantastic. Good fun. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that we're particularly proud of this year is we launched, uh, launched a project called DevOps Girls. So shout out to Alicia if she's in here. I was in your presentation uh, yesterday. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, DevOps Girls, JC, walk us through. Yeah, so what DevOps Girls uh, essentially is, is a free GitHub repo that contains instructions for a workshop for a day where women from all backgrounds. So we held the last one on February 4th. Yep. And um, we had DLs, BAs, um, people not necessarily that familiar with the tech, where they could learn what instances, ports are, what networking is, and at the end of the day, learn what automating things means, or like what infrastructure or code means. It costs yeah. about 44 bucks in Nothing. AWS to run. Um, and yeah, it's been super fun. It's great. I think we even managed to get a few girls' uh, junior positions in the tech industry outside of that, so yeah. really Be proud of that. that. Yeah. It's also been a great opportunity for us to grow our own people. Uh, this was a beautiful crop of our friendly, lovely staff who donated their weekend to kind of come in and uh, coach the women through the workshop. So yeah, it's great to see them put their hand up and, and grow as people. Uh, over the years, uh, I myself have been, and, and John, we've been invited into uh, universities throughout Australia. So uh, a little bit of history for me as well is that I was a head tutor and then a lecturer and a course leader in, in tertiary institutes in Melbourne. And this has been a great opportunity for me to go back 
and kind of promote uh, STEM careers, encouraging more ingress into our industry, and also a great opportunity to demystify what it is we do as SREs. Very uh, important work. Was that? Very, very important Very important work. work, yes, that's right. Because I think what you have to remember, uh, if you cast your mind back to maybe when you were deciding what you wanted to do at university, is that civil engineering, our cousins, those guys have been around for thousands of years, and we kind of know the domain pretty well, so the marketing's pretty good. Uh, but for software engineering, we've really only been doing it since the late 50s, so the marketing to kids is pretty bad. It's kind of really, they don't really understand what it is that we do in a, in a modern, global kind of networking infrastructure environment. Uh, we have even gone as far back as high schools. High schools. Yeah, you get, a, get them while they're young. Uh, this is a picture of uh, uh, more workshops that we've done within REA. Again, another great opportunity to show you know, to the young minds of the future just <laughs> how complicated the problems are that we have to solve and, and what a, a modern software engineering environment is compiled of. Yep. We also directly support and um, uh, directly mentor, actually, yeah. a lot of uh, junior developers uh, which is a highly, highly important part of, um, uh, for us anyway, of like what we do at Spring. Um, essentially what happens is that when junior developers come in, we pair them up with senior developers for a long-term relationship. So they could have that career guidance um, over a big span of time and identify their needs in equal measure. Yeah, so we've had a, a from all those sorts of examples, we've had a pretty broad range of experimentation over the years. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a good opportunity for us to have some ideas and some observations. Yep. And the key word here is actually education. Um, that's highly, highly important to us. Uh, on the first day of SRECon, LinkedIn talked about how everyone should be able to deploy code. Um, what we're focusing on is giving everyone that ability, um, giving people the knowledge that they need to operationalize or maintain systems basically maps to this idea of shared responsibility or ownership of whatever it is that you have built. Mm -hmm. So you build it, you deploy it, and you maintain it, you look after it, and it kind of cultivates this idea of craftsmanship about everything that we do, which has paid off uh, really, really well, actually. Yeah. 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 And, uh, uh, and we learned a lot, essentially, from working with a graduate program that we run, which is an 18-month program where graduates um, from, from uh, universities come into the company and they rotate between the businesses so we could teach them um, whatever we're doing, why it's important. Um, so hopefully they come out of it as fantastic, uh, brilliant engineers. Yeah, hopefully we can really fill out that bottom part of the triangle by the time they get to the end of that program. Mm -hmm. How many, how many generations of graduates do we have now, John? Yeah, I think we have had five. Five. So we have 14 this year, which is super fantastic. That's a lot for us. <laughs> uh, yeah, here we go. So we've uh, had opportunity over many iterations to kind of continuously improve. This is an example of just one of the like, code vacations that we take our new graduates out on. Mm -hmm. And uh, over that time, John, mm -hmm. I've uh, had an opportunity to make an observation through each generation of graduate as we brought them in. An observation, Matt. Yes, an observation. What is that observation? My observation, thank you for mm -hmm. asking, is that our graduates are pieces of Swiss cheese. Cheese. Yes, cheese. Cheese? From Switzerland? Switzerland. Yeah. Yep. Cheese. That's right. So you look just as confused <laughs> as about everybody in this half of the room, so please allow me to elaborate. I want you to consider that university is a service, or for programmers, a function. Here we go. It takes an input. Our input is the happy-go-lucky student. So if we know what the input is, it begs the question, what's the output? Well, to think about the output, we have to think about how this service works internally. I want you to imagine university as a many-to-one broadcast system. It's one presenter, like myself, uh, educating a large audience, like your beautiful selves. Now, the thing about this process is that you have to remember that each of you are beautifully talented, albeit very unique individuals, and you're all as unique as each other. So if I were to give us a hypothetical uh, site reliability exam. Like right the one now, in LinkedIn and Facebook? Like the one that, yeah, yeah. LinkedIn was running those tests. Oh, yeah. who oh. won that speaker? Yeah. Who got that? No, 15 people did. So. Oh, really? I did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Don't mess with us. Uh, no. So if I give you this hypothetical exam, right, uh, I'm going to assume that we're all professionals and we do pretty well. Let's say we're all A-plus students, and we all get 90%. 90%. I think that's pretty good. I'm very proud of all of you. That's a great result. If 
But what I'm interested in as an educator is the 10% that you didn't know. Now, what's particularly interesting about that 10% that each of you didn't know is that it's different for each of you. The 10% that you didn't understand is different to the person sitting next to you. You've all kind of you know, got different parts of the education that you grepped and the parts that you left behind. Now, this process kind of compounds over time through your professional experiences and your formal education, and eventually, as perfect as you are, we kind of leave gaps behind in our understanding. And this is particularly important for software engineers. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get this picture of people looking like Swiss cheese. Yeah. And our assertion, essentially, from the uh, artifact or the output that we've observed over the years is that this, um, this cheese artifact is the result of traditional learning systems being modeled as broadcasts. Mm. Now, if you think of broadcast as, a, say, a PubSub model, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you have a publisher, you stash a message onto that publisher, and then you have a couple of subscribers who listen into the topic, and they all receive the message. Yeah. Um, think uh, operational analog as, say, Amazon SNS. Um, you have an SNS topic, lots of, um, lots of uh, subscribers listen in to that topic, and when a message gets published, um, they get transferred out either via email or SMS or SMTP or whatever works. Yeah, I get that. Mm -hmm. So it's not all bad, though, the broadcast system. Uh, it has some good things going for it. One of them is quite evidently scale. Uh, we could scale this seemingly infinitely. If I blew this room out, two of us broadcasting to a large audience, a large audience is, is very effective. So it has scale going for it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty good, right? We've, we've gotten to this point. We filled out the bottom part of our triangle. This is like philosophical geometry. Uh, we have a base understanding. Hopefully, we, uh, through this process, we could get some pragmatic outcomes. And it scales really well. And you know what? For the most part, this is actually all we need. Like, uh, for, for a lot of the work that we do, we don't actually need that 100% understanding, or even 90% understanding. Sometimes 40% is enough. Right. Um, maybe all you need to do is um, pull a Docker image, or like push it, and then uh, serve it up. You, you don't need to really learn the fundamentals of it. And sure. um, yeah, it gives you a, a good competency. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can pull images. I haven't written a white paper on virtualization or hypervisors, but I can pull an image. Yeah. <laughs> so ooh, so uh, we have a missing part of our triangle up here. Uh, and I'm kind of curious about what it is. Mm -hmm. What is this bit? And yeah. how do we achieve it? Well, the bit that's missing is expertise. Uh, so the fundamentals at the bottom, top is expertise, but how do we get there? Um, we've had a couple of experiments over the years, so we've farmed out um, experts um, as essentially a queue that people could um, pull down from, um, have them like give, give developers vouchers so they could pair up with other experts and spend some time with them on a regular basis uh, so they could learn uh, more about the topic at hand. But out of all those experiments, um, nothing has actually uh, won over the tried and tested one-to-one -one mentoring. Um, but uh, how, how, how do we define mentorship anyway? Uh, so the way that we define mentorship is a respectful relationship between mentor and mentee, where you work together shoulder to shoulder, not eye to eye. It's not a position of authority. It's a position of equal understanding and just being on the same level, yeah. essentially. That sounds great. I love that sentiment. I love it a lot. But what does this look like in practice? So, you can think of mentorship as essentially like an end map. Um, you, you have a mentor, and then you have your mentee, and you're uh, trying to find out what open ports are there. Where are the gaps? Um, is 22 open? Is 80 open? Is 443 open? Do you need to learn the fundamentals of what HTTP looks like? Um, do you know how uh, DNS works, for example? Um, being uh, someone who can identify that it is a little bit like service discovery, because a lot of us here uh, have learned on the job through experience. But there's like a slight issue with experience because not every experience maps to a learning outcome. Sometimes you get an experience and it's already something that you know and this process can take a really, really long time. Yeah. And if you think of mentorship as a sort of like a personalized service discovery, having someone being able to identify um, whatever you need to learn, it's, it's quite fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's like a, it's a, you can kind of really hone in on where those gaps are. Like John said, it's like an MMAP process. It takes a lot, it's a lot faster. Mm -hmm. 
I feel like uh, I've been lucky enough to be in a lot of successful mentor relationships, and I have very easily uh, learned just as much in six months with a, with a good mentor as I have in six years in just time on the tool. And you can, yeah, so the mentor process is about finding those holes and, and reducing them somewhat. Uh, my only advice as, as a, a mentee myself is that the number one thing that you can do is practice constant humility. Uh, being humble opens your mind to new ideas and new perspectives and opinions. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. But the, um, the, the, the fact of identifying someone's gaps or whatever they need to learn, it's not the same as being the person who actually patches that problem. Um, a lot of mentors think that they need to know everything. You actually don't. You actually have to be there to identify what a person needs, and then you could point them to someone else. Maybe you have a friend who's an expert at a very specific domain. You could forward your mentee to that person um, so they could have that hot fix, yep. essentially. So and that, yeah. you know what? Throughout all the years, um, we've seen uh, a lot of mentor relationships over the years, and it's always had fantastic output. And the output of that uh, mentorship experience has always been more experts. Um, out of the graduate program or all the developers that we've seen uh, take on mentorship roles, uh, we've seen them uh, grow into uh, an expertise for a specific knowledge domain. And then in turn, they become experts who mentor other people who yeah. become experts. Like, like a, a perpetual, perpetual mentor machine. Yeah. No, it's great. Actually, some of our graduates have gone on to prove to be some of our best mentors. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, again, that's having that uh, right in the back of their mind. Their education is quite fresh to them, and they can really uh, access mm -hmm. you know, a level of sympathy and empathy. And that kind of gives us that tip of like the triangle that we were trying to look for, uh, where you have comfort with abstract concepts or advanced skills, uh, those skills that you only get when you actually understand the very basic fundamentals. They're the ones that you build on top of it. And the most important bit of this is the propagation aspect. Essentially, those mentees uh, eventually turn into expert, experts who can then teach other people. And if you have that triangle filled for a lot of your organization, well, it's going to serve you well. Yeah. I think, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so we've managed to, to fill out this triangle now through a series of, of, of mechanisms. Uh, that's great. How do we get here? Well, just to recap, that bottom part we filled out with broadcast mechanisms, and you know, traditional education is doing a pretty good job of that. And we're kind of filling out the top of the triangle with more intimate one-to-one -one mentor relationships. Mm -hmm. But why are we so obsessed with this triangle anyway? Well, why, why, why do we care so much about like, the tip of this? Why do we need more experts? Great question. Great question. <laughs> I don't need to be uh, the first one to tell any of you that software is just eating the world. Like it is invasive and pervasive into our into our culture and, and all industries. Uh, and it's we're, we're we're failing to upskill people fast enough at the rate of growth that we're experiencing. Yeah, with the intersection of a lot of things happening, um, development, operations, security, QA, data science. Uh, the lexicon is getting wider and wider, and the future looks really, really hard, actually. Um, and if there's anything that we would like you to personally take from this talk, it's that if, you, if, you, if, if you've tried mentoring, that's fantastic, but if you haven't yet, maybe perhaps uh, just give it a shot. Just consider giving it a shot. Take someone who's new at this, someone who's junior, and maybe ha catch up with them every now and then. Try to find out what they need. Yeah, I want to do that, John. I want to I want to start, but uh, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Yeah. Well, a lot of um, people who are a little bit intimidated by the aspect of mentoring think that you need either technical, vast technical excellence, or fantastic communication skills to be able to bridge that gap. But from our experiences with the many, many mentor-mentee relationships we've seen, you actually only ever need one thing. One thing. Yeah. Empathy. Empathy. Yeah. So empathy, uh, I believe, quite firmly, is a superconductor of the teaching learning experience. It is uh, invaluable in that entire process. So for me personally, I've been lucky enough to have a, a very, uh, very good mentor for the last two years of my life. And I made an observation recently of, of his mentor style. So I don't know if this carries, if people know the uh, metaphor of the carrot and the stick. So the, the stick is like a, a, a disciplinary, disciplinary, what? Disciplinary. Disciplinary, thank yeah. you. Threat 
uh, to the donkey, right? We've got a donkey, I've involved a donkey now, uh, to do work, and the carrot is like an enticing reward. So I am just wired in such a way that I respond to the stick. I like discipline, I like regiment, and that's just how I learn. And he had the context, the awareness, and the empathy to acknowledge that. And that was the way that we managed that relationship. But I noticed that he also was mentoring at the same time another girl my age, and he was very uh, patient and encouraging uh, and kind to her. And I feel like that is just a level of empathy that he managed to wield to be able to de be a different person based on the needs and the things that we wanted from that relationship. A lot of us here have gone into the industry and we've all had that person who got us started, who got us hooked into Linux and taught us a lot of things that would eventually lead us this way. Um, our ask, the, the, the ask that we have for this talk, is perhaps you should consider being that person, that person that you needed when you were younger, when you were just starting out. Yep. yep. So we would just like to uh, wrap up eventually now with a special thank you to the people who've been mentors to us. This is an opportunity for me to make them feel really good about themselves. We're trying to get a photo of us with the name. Oh, wait, I'm not even in it. All right, all right, there we go. So uh, thank you very much to these people. Remember that you could, in turn, be that person for who you were when you were younger. We would just like to say thank you for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs>